Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the closing plenary. Please welcome Chairman of the Board of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, Mr. Fred Ryan. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Reagan Foundation Institute, thank you for joining us this evening. I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our two panelists and Ted Olson in just a moment. We have a number of distinguished guests with us. Uh, but I would like to take a moment first to thank Justice Brett Kavanaugh for joining us this evening. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Today has been a time to celebrate the legacy of the first woman appointed to the United States Supreme Court. This evening we have the privilege of welcoming the second and the third. We're extraordinarily grateful to Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor for joining us to honor Sandra Day O'Connor. It turns out that Justice Ginsburg and Justice O'Connor share an unusual distinction, and that is interesting nicknames. When Justice O'Connor was confirmed, she earned the moniker FWOTSC for first woman on the Supreme Court. Justice Ginsburg, meanwhile, has been crowned the notorious RBG. <laughs> so I'll leave it to you to decide which one is catchier. The justices also share a lifelong commitment to expanding opportunities for women. So it makes sense that when Justice Ginsburg joined Justice O'Connor on the bench in 1993, the two bonded over their historic role in transforming the Supreme Court. Both justices had to overcome discrimination and professional rejection. But Justice O'Connor once put a helpful spin on it. If they had come of age when women could easily be lawyers, she told Justice Ginsburg, they would probably have ended up as retired partners at some law firm. But because that route was not open to us, Justice O'Connor explained, we had to find another way, and we both ended up in the United States Supreme Court. One woman they inspired was a young attorney in Manhattan. She'd been working in the DA's office in 1981 when she heard that President Reagan had nominated Sandra Day O'Connor. Just two years earlier, she and her law school classmates had wondered aloud whether they would ever see a woman on the Supreme Court in their lifetimes. Little did Sonia Sotomayor imagine that 28 years later, she would become the third woman on the court and make history in her own right as the first Latina justice. These three women come from very different backgrounds. One grew up shooting jackrabbits on a ranch in remote Arizona. One is a descendant of Jewish immigrants who was raised in Brooklyn. And one spent her childhood summers visiting her parents' native Puerto Rico. They followed three separate paths to the American dream, but ended up in the same place as accomplished lawyers, courageous trailblazers, inspiring role models, and associate justices of the Supreme Court. We are deeply grateful to them for all that they have done and all that they represent. Joining Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor on stage this evening is Reagan Foundation trustee and former Solicitor General Ted Olson. Ted has argued more than 60 cases before the Supreme Court, so he's used to taking questions from Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor. But tonight, the tables are turned. <laughs> Ted finally gets to ask the questions. And that may be why he's worked so hard to help organize this event. <laughs> uh, we are deeply grateful to his efforts for making today's conversation possible. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Associate Justices of the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor. I know most of that was for the justices. <laughs> we are so honored at the Reagan Institute to have this program today, which those of you who have been here from the beginning know it's been a marvelous, marvelous experience. We have had many of Justice O'Connor's clerks here and some of her friends and colleagues talking about her legacy, what it meant when she was appointed to the Supreme Court, uh, what her, her, a bit about her jurisprudence. And it's been an exciting, interesting conversation. And I worried, as I was hearing this, what 
can we add to that? Because we're going to talk about some of the same things. But they heard some of the audience heard a lot about Justice O'Connor and her jurisprudence and what she meant to the court and to America. But they didn't hear it from the only perspective that the two of you can provide. Her colleagues in the history of the United States Supreme Court. Um, and so I'm going to ask some of the questions that the people here, I'm sure, are anxious to learn about. And I'll start with you, Justice Ginsburg. Um, what was your reaction and how, what were your feelings when you first heard that Justice O'Connor was going to be nominated to be on the United States Supreme Court? I was driving home from the D.C. Circuit and turned on the news, and the nomination of Sandra Day O'Connor was announced. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also thought, this is a sign that what Jimmy Carter began is going to be advanced forward. And what Jimmy Carter began was to change the complexion of the US judiciary. When he became president, there was only one woman on a federal court of appeals, that was Shirley Huff Stetler. He made her the first ever secretary of education. And then there were none. Shirley Hofstadler. Yeah. And Carter, although he had only four years and no Supreme Court vacancy to fill, he did literally change the complexion of the federal courts by appointing women and members of minority groups in numbers. I think President Reagan was saying, Jimmy Carter was right and I am going to make the big stride forward of appointing a woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. So you saw this as a continuum of what President Carter had started, and it was a change in the opportunities for women to be a part of the federal ju or ju judiciary anyway, anywhere. Yes, people sometimes ask, did you always want to be a Supreme Court justice? I said, in the ancient days when Justice O'Connor and I graduated from law school, what we wanted was a job, any job. Well, we won't talk about too much about the, the job opportunities, at least at the beginning. Justice Sotomayor, uh, where were you, and how did you learn about this nomination, this appointment, and what was your reaction? At the time, I was an assistant district attorney in New York County. And um, I was working hard, but as all of you know, uh, Ruth works harder than most of us. So I got to see it on the news that night. And to me, I had just graduated from law school a um, year and a half before, maybe two, two year before, year before. Um, and at the time, there were obviously no women on the Supreme Court. There were hardly any women in the federal judiciary. There were, I think, maybe one or two women on the Supreme Courts of other states. Um, and the idea, and people, law firms, were touting that they were progressive when they had one woman partner among 100. And so, what Ruth had started, I still had not seen the progress being made in any significant numbers just yet. But the appointment of Sandra gave me a hope. It opened the door to me thinking that the progress would move faster than I had imagined. Didn't move quite as fast as I had hoped, <laughs> and still, some steps to be taken, but it was a door opener. It was an opportunity for women to begin to see the possibility of exploring all aspects of our profession. You see, 
the advantage of diversity, whether it's gender or race or ethnicity, or even professional work, whatever the diversity represents, it gives people who don't otherwise think there's opportunity. It inspires them to believe there might be. And so I think seeing a woman on the court inspired not just me, but so many other young women who are starting their careers. Do you think, Justice Sotomayor, that Justice O'Connor has very special qualities in terms of her character, her background, her up upbringing, um, her... Well, I'll tell you what I that, thought when that I made heard... her be sure. ideal as a first, or... Uh, <laughs> the only thing that scared me was she was a woman who had done it all. She was married, she raised children, she had served in the legislature, she had served in the court system, and I thought to myself, oh my God, if that's the standard I'm gonna be held to, I'm not gonna accomplish anything. Um, Ruth pretty much did something similar in her work. Um, yes, I do think it takes those extraordinary women who broke those initial barriers had a fortitude about them, a resilience, a persistence that was absolutely necessary to be able to um, do what they did. Uh, now, as you know, Justice Kagan and I are not married. We don't have children. We've had successful careers, and I don't think that you have to be unmarried and have, not have children to have successful careers. But I do think it helped back then that she represented everything that people expected and more. Justice Ginsburg, what qualities did you see uh, and experience with Justice O'Connor that helped craft her for the, for the position of being, uh, as Evan Thomas says in his book, first? It's got to be, and you were second, um, and you were third. Uh, it has got to be carry special burdens and, and a much sense of sense of obligation to the people that are out there watching and seeing you as an example, as a role model. What qualities did she bring to that role? Sandra was responsible more than any, probably any justice in history, for the collegiality of the Supreme Court. That was very important to her. When she revived the tradition of having lunch together and urged her colleagues to attend, she was also a good listener and she had patience. And I never saw her snap back in anger. Um, Sandra was a person who, whatever came her way in life, and some things that were not, um, not at all fortunate, she coped with, like uh, her breast cancer. I don't know how many women were inspired to carry on, to have courage to do what she did. And then when John O'Connor became ill, how she dealt with that, just whatever life brought her way, she just did it. It's, that was her, her well, attitude. Part of her background was being raised in part on a big, several hundred, a couple hundred thousand acre cattle ranch in Arizona. Part of the growing up was no electricity, no running water. Um, she went to school on the West Coast in Stanford. The two of you are from a decidedly different environment, New York City, uh, Brooklyn, uh, so forth, um, and, and we're educated on the East. Does that make any difference? Um, or would it have made any difference? Of course it makes a difference. Everyone brings his or her life experience to bear. But I think uh, Sandra's attitude since her childhood was she can do it. And when she went out for the roundups and she, she rode with the cowboys and one of them said she wasn't the rough and rugged type 
but she worked with us well in the canyons. She held her own, and that's what she did at every stage of her career. She held her own. Both of you broke many barriers, um, and in many respects, each of you were first in many parts of your career, uh, including on the Supreme Court in many different ways. Um, Justice Sotomayor, describe that. Well, do you feel special obligations to women or to the legal profession or to the judiciary because you are breaking every day uh, these barriers? I don't think that I feel a special obligation to a particular group of people. I do feel, as a justice, whether I'm a woman or, or not, an obligation to uphold the values of the court. And I think that that's what Sandra felt, a deep commitment to the institution. And that goes along with Ruth's description of her emphasis on the collegiality of the court. I tell a story that the justices were at a meeting, I don't remember if it was lunch or conference, and we got distracted in a conversation about a book that described many, um, a time in the Supreme Court history when the justices were openly uh, hostile to each other. And someone asked, what changed that? And a, some of my colleagues were suggesting the names of one or more chief judges. And all of a sudden, a quiet voice in the room said, when women came on the court. <laughs> Um, and Justice Ginsburg was right about that. I do remember, though, Ruth, the first time I met Sandra at the court, the first morning after my induction that I was there, she came to visit me, which I was humbled and um, said to her, I was going to try to come see you. And she said, no, 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 no. You're a new justice. I'm welcoming you. Um, but one of the things she spoke to me about was my ob obligation to attend the, the daily, the, uh, the lunches that the judges had. Um, and she told me she had told the chief that it was his obligation to continue the tradition. So it continued even after her um, taking, taking senior status and leaving the court, that emphasis on the institution of well, maintaining not just its collegiality, but the sense of its importance in our society. Well, I was going to follow up on that about the collegiality because the, it can be very tense, I suppose. I don't know. Um, none of us really know except for Justice Kavanaugh. <laughs> but it, the, at the, the atmosphere must from time to time be very tense, especially at the end of the term when some the very controversial decisions are rendered and there are sometimes very strong opinions and strong dissents. Um, does that collegiality carry through even when there is a lot of tension uh, in the decisions and sometimes in the language of the decisions? Justice Ginsburg? Ted, this is an episode in which you played a major role. It, 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 it was not the end of the term, but I suppose the most tense moment I've experienced in my 26 years on the court was the decision in Bush v. Gore. It was a marathon. Was the court granted review on a Saturday, briefs filed on Sunday, oral argument on Monday, decisions out on Tuesday. When it was over, I sent my clerks to watch what the newscasters were saying about it to Justice Kennedy's chambers, because he wrote the principal opinion for the court. Justice Scalia called me that evening to say, what are you doing still in your chambers? You should go home and take a hot bath. This was the night of the decision, the 12th? Yes. Well, it was tense, that case. And I'm not asking anything that happened in, you know, um, that we shouldn't be talking about. But 
Um, we do know, we do know that there were a lot of difficult feelings um, about whether the court should have taken the case or how the court was going to decide the case. Justice O'Connor has famously um, uh, characterized as not jabbing back, not responding to uh, a harsh criticism and a separate opinion or a concurring opinion. Um, uh, is that part of what you're talking about? Well, she responded to ideas, but never to individuals. Um, you would never see in an O'Connor opinion, as you've seen in some opinions of the court, one justice saying about another justice's opinion, this opinion is not to be taken seriously. In fact, that was said of Justice O'Connor's opinion. She never snapped back uh, to speak in the same strident voice. She did answer arguments that were made, but she was never critical of a colleague. You would never see in her opinions this opinion is, is profoundly misguided. And in that, I tried to follow her lead. Is it hard, Justice Sotomayor, sometimes to resist? Because I read these opinions. <laughs> I have. Uh, and some, one of them, day, some of them are pretty yeah. pointed. One day, Justice Scalia looked at me and said, I really love you, Sonia. You're a bulldog like I am. Uh, we're both New York City street fighters. He was right. Uh, I have been helped in restraining myself um, with the intervention of colleagues, which is one of the things that you asked about how do we maintain that collegiality. Um, other colleagues will step in, have conversations with you, and suggest that some things have crossed the line. Um, others I um, have received, and I won't mention what it was about or who it was, but an apology from a colleague for something that was said in heated argument. Um, and that, I know, was likely prompted by someone else saying, hmm, what did you do? Or do you really mean that? Um, and so it's to remain collegial, to understand your obligation to work with each other, assuming each other's good faith. Um, it gets challenged when you disagree. But that's the time when you need to come to your senses and the group needs to continue insisting upon the nature of our family. So I was going to ask about the oral arguments. Sometimes the oral arguments, the justices are asking uh, the advocate questions, but they're really talking to one another. Um, is that you true? You know that feeling that you are being talked through and not to. <laughs> and I've never understood, Ruth, why lawyers don't let us do that more often. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> well, Chief Justice Roberts has talked about this a little bit about the oral, the, con the context of the oral argument, and, and I've heard either him or someone say, uh, we're, we don't talk to one another too much about the cases before oral argument. This is the first time, in, now correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first time we've talked to one another and we're doing it through the medium of the, of the poor guy or woman standing six feet away. Um, is that well, true? The, the, the first time that we've considered a case together would have been at the petition for review stage. I mean, the, the, the discussion is fleeting, but at least we would have been together and, noticing this case that has been granted review. Then there's not much discussion before the argument. Frankly, there isn't time because as the term goes on, you're gearing up for the sitting, you're writing opinions for the sitting just 
passed. You may not have finished the reply brief in the case that's being argued the next day till the night before. So that's why there isn't much in the way of discussion before the oral argument. But we are constantly trying to persuade each other. I mean, every time I'm writing a dissent for four people, I am hoping that I will pick up one more vote. And mostly that hope is disappointed, but, <laughs> but I remember vividly one term when my senior colleague assigned a dissent to me, just for himself and me. So the court divided seven to two. In the fullness of time, the judgment came out six to three, but the two had swelled to six and the seven had shrunk to three. So a famous- It can happen. Yeah, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was um, Yogi Berra that said mm -hmm. that, wasn't it? I didn't know Ruth was familiar with him, but <laughs> <laughs> she always pleasantly surprises me. Justice O'Connor was often the one to ask the first question when yes. he was on the yes. court, and it always was a very tough question, and it really required the advocate to be prepared for something in the record, something about, and you do that too. Um, you ask often the first question, as, as you do, Justice Sotomayor. Um, you're breaking the ice, or you're trying to find a w probe a weakness. Um, I know Justice O'Connor was, you know, getting the getting it started and wanting yes, to. Yes, I always waited till she asked the first question. Pardon? I always waited for her to ask. That was kind of the signal that we could we could stop the soliloquy and engage in a colloquy. <laughs> <laughs> the most awkward moment for me was the first argument after Justice Scalia's death. Um, I think we were all a bit shell-shocked. And I remember sitting there and the poor advocate standing up there and talking and no one was interrupting him. Unheard of when the justice was alive. Probably unheard of now. That may be a time in which I felt like I had to break the ice because it was a painfully long time. You could see it in the poor advocate. He was sort of... <laughs> What, what, what is happening here? Um, my problem is that I was a district court judge. And when you're a district court judge, it's your fiefdom. <laughs> you don't have to wait for anybody. Um, it's hard to adjust to waiting for eight other colleagues to have a say. And so that's my problem. Um, I'm still trying to bring it under control. Um, <laughs> But I do think that when any of us asks questions, it's because the issue is important to us. Of course. Now, Justice O'Connor was one time, I, I understand, in a cameo appearance in Henry V. Yes, she uh, was the Queen and, of France in, in the treaty scene. And she said, happily, a woman's voice may do some good. Mm -hmm. um, and then... What, is, what does that mean in the context of a justice on the Supreme Court? Is there a woman's voice? What does it mean? What difference does it make? Is it sexist to say that or stereotypical to say that? Well, Sandra would, Sandra would probably quote, as she did many times, um, a Minnesota Supreme Court Justice, Jean Coyne, who said, at the end of the day, a wise old man and a wise old woman will reach the same judgment. And I think that's true, but Sandra would have followed it up by saying, we each bring our life experience to the table. Growing up female is not the same as growing up male. And you could see the difference in an opinion that Justice O'Connor wrote it came out at the end of her very first term on the court. 
It was uh, Hogan against Mississippi University for Women. This was about a man who wanted to become a nurse. And the best nursing school in his area was the Mississippi University for Women. Hogan challenged the exclusion as a denial of equal protection. And one of the then justices, Justice Powell, looked on the reservation of the nursing school to women as a kind of a affirmative action for women. So it was OK. But Sandra, if you read between the lines, what she's saying is, if you want to improve the status of women in the nursing profession, the best way to do it is to get men to want to do the job, because the pay inevitably will go up. <laughs> so that was an insight that she had. She re recognized that reserving that school to women was not, not a favor to women. So that decision struck down that exclusionary policy, as I recall. Yes. And then I understand, I remember this pretty well, that you cited her language in that decision and your decision in United States versus Virginia. Yes, in which you also played a major role. <laughs> <laughs> that one I'm um, um, uh, very proud of, but the vote, I can't recall what the vote was. There was, <laughs> there was one person who agreed with you, <laughs> Justice Scalia, that was all. <laughs> but it was only an eight justice court. Yes. So. <laughs> Uh, I, I understand that, um, that Justice Stevens, who was in the majority, assigned that to um, Justice O'Connor, and she said that should go to Ruth? Yes. Yeah. And so can you tell us well, about that? What happened, when, and why, and what did you do with that? Why did Justice Stevens offer the dissent, I mean, the opinion for the court, uh, to Justice O'Connor? Because... Seniority is a major factor in our workplace. So if you were the junior justice, you tend not to get the, <laughs> the most uh, exciting cases. And I was pretty junior then. But Sandra recognized that this was something I cared a whole lot about. And so she told Justice Stevens that I should write the, I should write the opinion. Does that happen very often? <laughs> it's, it talks, it says so much about the generosity of her spirit. It hardly ever happens. So what can, what can you add, Justice Sotomayor, about a woman's voice and the fact that there you're going back to my confirmation hearing. <laughs> um, this was, I, this I, was a first in 1981. Now we're, now we're 38 years later or something like that. There are three women on the court. Justice Ginsburg has said there, she'll be happy when there's nine. Um, no, I said, the question is, when will there be enough? So the answer is obvious. There will be enough when there are nine. <laughs> now, that was a good thing. I mean, nobody asks any questions about all the years when all nine were men. Well, I think so. people feel that you have a point. I can tell, <laughs> can tell from the reaction. Justice Sotomayor, have you any other thoughts about that? Um, I, I, uh, I use as an example in some of my speeches something that happened in a Virginia case involving the Spotford case, involving the young woman who was strip searched in her school because of an allegation that she was seen taking an aspirin. It was a no drug case. I wasn't on the court, so I am repeating something that was just public knowledge. Apparently some of my male colleagues were asking questions to suggest that this strip search was equivalent 
to uh, students undressing in the gym. For those who are women, um, I think most of us know that um, puberty is a time in which there is a heightened sensitivity to the privacy of one's body. And the idea that an opinion could have been written by one of our uh, brothers that might have suggested that, that, that this search was something less than an affront to the dignity of a young girl would have been an appalling writing. I do think, and, and my colleague, um, Justice Ginsburg, was heard to say after the argument that she thought that her male colleagues didn't understand what it was like to be a young girl. I said it at the argument. I'm sorry. And it stopped the way, the way the questions were going. I said a 13-year-old girl is not the same as a 13-year-old and in the, in the sense of uh, the, the invasion of her privacy. This, this girl was accused of having drugs. Well, the drugs turned out to be one at Advil and the other uh, something, something comparable. But she was taken to the girl's bathroom, strip searched. She was then taken to the principal's office and she sat in a chair outside the principal's office till her mother came to call for her. Her mother was outraged and sued the school district for what had been done to her, her daughter. But I think it, in the middle of that argument, the tenor of the questions changed. They were no longer joking about it. I, I, I read that colloquy. You, you made that point quite clear during the argument. Yeah. So the point being, in my raising that example, is that clearly we come to judging with our life experiences, and that includes every bit of it. Um, and I remind people that wise old men and wise old women disagree and come to different conclusions on the court in many, many decisions. So it's not the wisdom of gender. It is simply the wisdom of life and coming and bringing as many perspectives as we can to the process of a, judging. A diversity of background, a diversity of education, a diversity of, of, ex of, of legal experience. That's why Sandra gave Ruth the VMI case. She had spent her life on the issues of equality for women. And it was a fitting tribute to what Ruth had done. I, that's sort of why I asked the question about um, Justice O'Connor growing up on a, a vast ranch in Arizona. Um, I couldn't do half the things she did. Pardon? I couldn't do half the things. She f rode horses. She uh, fly fished. I go across the country to hear judges telling me how she came to visit, and they'd be out in the middle of this ice cold river or uh, fly fishing. I believe she hunted. Um, I know Ruth has flown out of airplanes and gone in back of boats. I don't do any of that stuff. <laughs> well, now so these are indestructible. She also, she also went around a golf course faster than anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and a heck of a tennis player too, I, get, I gather. But, she, but, um, and she came from the West um, and went to Stanford. Justice Kennedy came from the West. Now you are all pretty much from the eastern part of the United States. All of you went to Yale or Harvard Law School, uh, and, and, and most of you went to Ivy League undergraduate. Uh, Princeton was a big part of it. So there's not much diversity in that respect on the court now. Is that anything that you think has an impact, or? or some, some high courts, Canada's high court, has proportional uh, geographical representation. So a certain number of justices come from the West Coast provinces. We don't do that. In fact, it was one state that for a time was vastly overrepresented, and that was Arizona, 
because there was Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor. Population of Arizona is not. Uh, but not until that long. Justice Scalia passed away, there were four of you from of the five boroughs of New yeah, York City. Yeah, yeah. So we were diverse. The only thing we were missing was Staten, Staten Island. Staten Island. <laughs> you, I'm sure the, the president, if he had an opportunity, whoever the president was, was, would have been looking for someone 50 years old from Harvard and Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a few of them, by the way. <laughs> so but does, should that matter? Um, should there was a time earlier in our history when there were certain geographic areas where were presumed to be it was a southern seat or something like that? Uh, should that matter? The diversity of experience includes where you grew up. By the way, you left out one Wester. Justice Breyer grew up on the West Coast in San Francisco. Yeah, but then he wound up at Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that a special taint? <laughs> <laughs> well, you left. Yes, and I have no Harvard Law School degree. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask a question about um, Justice O'Connor was a trailblazer. People knew who she was. This is the, maybe the first time for, in a long time that someone knew somebody the name of somebody and the face of somebody on the United States Supreme Court. And in that sense, she was a, a, not a role model, a trailblazer, because people would look at her and see this is attainable and this makes a difference. You've each been very much out in public. Uh, you've written a best-selling book, Justice Sotomayor. This is, you've got your own t-shirt factory. Um, <laughs> so, to what degree um, relinquishing your privacy? The court won't let cameras in the courtroom, um, and there are various reasons we don't need to talk about that, but you're relinquishing your privacy to explain or make available to the American public your experiences and your feelings and who you are. I mean, that has to have a big impact um, on the American people, uh, and women in particular. You make that decision consciously. I'm going to. I'm going to go out there because I'm not just a justice. I'm. I'm. A, I'm a public figure, and it's important for me to be out there and answer questions. Um, you go to a lot of places and give interviews to, uh, to law schools and, and bar associations. You you speak in public a lot, Justice Sotomayor. Um, what goes through your mind with respect to that? How much privacy are you willing to give up in order to maybe perform that function? My mail was just fluttered with letters that went like this. Last year, or five years ago, Justice O'Connor visited our law school, our bar association, our country. <laughs> and she did go to all 50 states. She was a great ambassador of the United States to other places. So the letters that I got <laughs> after Justice O'Connor was here, it was as recently as Monday when I was in Raleigh, North Carolina at a women's college called Meredith. And they were very proud that Sandra Day O'Connor had come there in 1991. I don't know how she managed all the invitations that she got, but she made a concerted effort to speak in every state of the union and to be available when the government wanted an ambassador who was not in part of the political world to help countries that were struggling to install a rule of law to give them encouragement and assistance. So the tagline of the letters that I got was, she was here, now it's your turn. <laughs> So what go, uh, what I'm going to ask you too, Justice Sotomayor, what goes through your mind when you're, you're inundated, I'm sure, with invitations, both of you, to be, be here and be here and be here, and you've got very hard jobs. This is very demanding work that you do, but you take the time to go to bar associations, to go to state law, school, law schools and travel. What goes through your mind? Um, you feel that that's important for you to do what Justice O'Connor started, pretty much. 
uh, and you both have been doing? Well, the most important thing is, is the court's work, and I don't let outside engagements interfere with the time that I must reserve to read the opinions below, the briefs, prepare for the oral arguments. So while the, while the term is ongoing, I try to limit the amount of my distant travel. But we do have visitors at the court all the time. We have school children from second grade to the graduate level coming. In many of the groups that I speak to, I speak to at one of the court's conference rooms. What I'm getting at is why do it? I mean, why do you give that much more, Justice Sotomayor, why do you give that time to the people that you go to visit and talk to? What are you- Well, you asked, I, I know this is truth for Justice Ginsburg, it's certainly true for me. You do give up a sense of privacy. And, and there virtually is no place in the United States that I can travel without people recognizing me. Um, we were in Portugal together this past summer, and I hired a toot toot driver to take me around the city, and he took me to one of their famous bakeries. And as I walked in, there was a Puerto Rican family who saw me walk in and surrounded me. And this poor tutu driver then saw the entire store, entire bakery, come over to take pictures with me. So we finally sat down, and he got me the miniature pastry he wanted me to taste. And he looked at me and said, who are you? <laughs> um, but that does happen. And you're right, we, you do give up a sense of privacy when you go out to the public. Um, when I first got to the court, um, there were these three garbage collecting bins. The huge ones you see in a building where they take the individual baskets and put it into a huge big one. There were three of them sitting there with letters. And I'm looking at them and opening them and the mail delivery guy comes in and I say, three of these? And he said, oh no, 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 there's three more downstairs. Um, I had all the letters open that year, and I organized all of the different groups who wanted me to speak. And I sat down and said to myself, okay, what do I want to accomplish as a justice? That's what I'm asking. What's the legacy? I made a decision that my legacy was to reach out to as many children as I could, to inspire them to first become civically involved, and secondly, not to give up hope for themselves. And just virtually everything I do is geared to that end. So it was, whether it was my memoir, where in my preface I tell, I explain that I'm writing my book for those people like me who come from difficult backgrounds in the hopes that they will understand that they too can have a good life and a meaningful one. My most recent book that just came out this summer, Just Ask, is geared to children with chronic life conditions. And the entire message of the book is that we are equal in every meaningful way to everyone else. Um, and so the, that makes it easier for me um, to choose among the invitations I get. Now, obviously, you do some things. I'm here, right? Not many kids in here, or at least not young kids. Um, because there are people who you're fond of, and I am fond of Justice O'Connor, um, and you do things because there are people that you love and who are important to you, who ask you to do things that you do. But virtually all of my appearances have a relationship to children. Um, and that's why when uh, Justice O'Connor stopped being able to be actively involved in iCivics, the organization 
she formed and launched and cared about so deeply. Uh, when they asked me to join the board, I joined it because her message is very much in keeping with my own. So, Ted, I made conscious decisions about where I can have the greatest impact and with the two goals in mind that I set forth, which is to give people hope who might not otherwise have it and to inspire people to believe in our government and our system of government and to have respect for the court system. And I think if we, we, one starts that process in young people, that it can very much change the tenor of our country. Um, Justice O'Connor believed very fervently that the partisanship in politics started when they stopped teaching civics in schools. And, she, and she's right. Um, and I bear her standard in terms of saying exactly the same thing. We have to go back to talking to each other and really talking and really understanding what civic participation means. Well, that's a wonderful, wonderful answer, a wonderful approach, and it's, and it's another reason why we're so grateful that you're here. Um, this, the, you're in a position where because of who you are, um, people will listen, people will watch, people will learn from you, people will be inspired by you. Justice Ginsburg, you have not at all shied away from being the notorious RBG. Every, every, every woman and every girl in my family has T-shirts or mugs or whatever it is. And, um, you but she does you, too. You haven't, <laughs> you haven't backed away from that at all. Um, and you, you've well, joked you know, about the fact that people want to have their picture taken with you. Yes, <laughs> and I'm at 86 and a half years old and everyone wants to take a picture with me. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the notorious RBG was started by a second year student at New York University Law School who was displeased with the court's decision in the Shelby County case that held unconstitutional, a key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So this student was at first angry and then thought to herself, anger is not a useful emotion, doesn't get you any place. She was gonna do something positive. So she took the bench announcement of my dissent in Shelby County case case and she started a blog and then it took took out into the stratus <laughs> she called it the notorious RBG because there was a well-known rapper <laughs> the notorious BIG and people asked me nobody well, nobody knows about him anymore <laughs> But the two of us have something very important in common. What can that be? We were both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. And, and shortly after that, your paths diverged. <laughs> but there is value, the same as what Justice Sotomayor is saying, is value. I think to the American people, to the young people, to women and men, to hear you, see you, be aware of you. Uh, they learn about the court, they learn about the institution, but they learn about your life story. Both of your life story uh, are so inspiring. You must be aware of the fact that people are drawing inspiration and, and uh, about their, themselves all the time because of this. Well, if I can give people hope, that's tremendously satisfying. I think Ted, this I, was so, such as um, it, it really is amazing the number of products. Even most recently, I was sent a set of um, air fresheners, closet, closet fresheners, <laughs> bathroom glasses, and 
But I think it's, it's sad. People want something hopeful. To believe that what's important to them is, is shared by many other people. But I think it's, it's that more than anything, the, the desire to have something positive uh, in your vision. I think it's that plus it's also, and Justice this brings us back to Justice O'Connor. Um, she was a believer in I can do it. And she would tell people, she would tell her clerks, just do it. Now, when she writes in her book uh, about being sent out miles and miles to bring lunch to the ranch hands when during a roundup and she had a flat tire and had to explain to her father why she had showed up late, he said, just start early, uh, start earlier next time. But, the, but with her, she was determined to overcome all kinds of obstacles and she wasn't offered a job like you uh, when she graduated from law school. The idea that you can accomplish things as an underdog uh, or, or someone that's facing disadvantage, that is also the lesson that you're both giving, that, giving to people. That you're said, that's the message you're sending to people. You can do it. I'm going to tell you a story about um, just do it, just as O'Connor, one of her favorite expressions. It was my very first term on the court. We had had the first sitting, and I was expecting that the Chief Justice would assign to me a unanimous decision in a one-issue case. Instead, Chief Justice Rehnquist assigned to me a miserable ERISA case. ERISA is... <laughs> probably the most dense statute Congress ever passed. In any case, and we was not unanimous, it was six to three. Justice O'Connor was one of the three. I complained to her, I said, Sandra, he wasn't supposed to do that to me. <laughs> and she said, Ruth, you just do it. <laughs> just do it and get your opinion in circulation before he makes the next set of assignments. Otherwise, you will risk getting an, another unpleasant case. <laughs> <laughs> but that was her attitude about everything. Just do it. Well, now, about her, we've heard a lot about she was both a consensus builder and a trailblazer. And I suppose that in some sense, being one is the antithesis of the other. If you're out there writing a singular dissent, strong dissent. Um, and Chief Justice Rehnquist, when he was just, an, uh, was as an associate justice, uh, was a singular dissent a lot. That must be somewhat in tension with being a consensus builder. You think about that, Justice Sotomayor? Um, well, I do because I'm not the consensus builder. <laughs> I think there is a tension. Um, however, um, I don't think that Sandra, and, and I must admit that I didn't serve as long with her as Ruth did, but I don't think that Justice O'Connor um, worried about being a trailblazer. I think she focused her life on just doing. And for her, um, what was right, she wouldn't accept that others wouldn't understand it. And so from, you read it in Evan Thomas's book, she really, by force of, or dink of personality, basically forced people to either join her or leave her, but she really worked on consensus in the sense of, this is the right thing to do. So do working on a consensus and bringing people together and getting five votes uh, sometimes doesn't accomplish what a, a, a lone dissent can do. Um, it wasn't a lone dissent, your Ledbetter decision, but the dissent made a huge difference. Um, so there's a role for that, and I know she, from time to time, she did do that. Um, and so I, that's what I'm asking, is, is when do you decide that I'm going to get out there and 
and maybe read my dissent someday in June. As you know, most of the time, dissents are announced but not summarized from the bench. The author of the court's opinion will say, Justice so-and-so, joined by Justice so-and-so, dissented, period. But if you think the court got it not just wrong, but egregiously wrong, then it will speak out at the session and announce your dissent from the bench, which I did in Lily Ledbetter's case. It was 5-4, it was not a lone dissent. But my tagline was, the Lily Ledbetter's case involved uh, Title Seven. And my tagline was, the ball is now in Congress's court to correct the error into which my colleagues have fallen. And there was a, just a, a wonderful coalition, huge majorities on both sides of the aisle to pass the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which was the first piece of legislation President Obama signed when he took The very next office. Congress. Yeah. But I had a, a model for that because years before in the 70s, in the late 70s, then Justice Rehnquist had come to the conclusion that discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is not discrimination on the basis of sex. That was so startling that it sparked a coalition of, um, that very quickly amended Title VII to read simply, discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is discrimination. That's the Pregnancy Disability Act. Yes. So, well, I would call it the Pregnancy Umbility Act. But the, but the notion that it couldn't be sex discrimination because after all, the world is divided into non-pregnant people, that includes many women and all men, And then there were these pregnant people, and they were all women. <laughs> so it couldn't be gender-based discrimination. <laughs> the same thing with Lily Ledbetter's case. So dissents can really make a difference um, in certain circumstances. Justice Sotomayor, you? Oh, I believe they do. I think they galvanize groups to, um, to do what civic participation means to go out there and lobby and, and move for reform. It happened in both cases, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act and the Betsy Letterman Act as well. And so, and sometimes it has it in other ways. I did a dissent from a denial of certiorari in, in an Alabama case about jury overrides and there was ultimately a legislative fix that occurred when groups galvanized to change that in Alabama. Um, they can have, they can draw a spotlight on issues that the public should think about. And if they are as outraged as we are, um, it, can, it can move change, certainly it can. Justice um, Stevens was confirmed by a unanimous, unanimously in the Senate. Justice O'Connor was also. Justice Scalia was. Um, there were only nine votes against. Only three. Three. <laughs> oh, that's that. That's that Breyer guy that was nine. I don't know. But yeah. But it is now, um, and there were thirty-one in your in your. Mm -hmm. situation in, in the last few there's been over 40 uh, is are we at a point where there's no turning back in terms of the contentiousness of the confirmation process and what kind of damage does that do to your institution if you think back way back to 1980 when I got my first good job in DC I was appointed to the 
Court of Appeals. The chair of the Judiciary Committee was Ted Kennedy. The ranking minority member was Strom Thurmond. Those two worked together to get well-qualified judges appointed to the federal courts. It was the same thing 1993 when I was nominated, then Senator, then Senator Joe Biden chaired the committee. Orrin Hatch was the ranking minority member. On that Judiciary Committee, Orrin Hatch was my biggest supporter. That's the way it should be, and the way I hope I will see again in my lifetime. But it will take people who really care about our country to say, enough of this dissension. Let's come together and do the work that should be done. How, Justice Sotomayor, before we we're about done, is there anything that, I don't know whether the justices can do anything. I know Chief Justice Roberts has spoken about it, but is there anything that um, the citizens, as citizens that we can do, we could exhort people to be more decent and civil in the process? Anything else? But it's not just exhortation. That's what I mean. It, it, it is both um, speaking out publicly about it. Um, if politicians hear the outcry, they will respond. They often and mostly do. But we have to educate the public about the problem, and we have to educate them about the risks that continuing to perceive judges as partisan creatures will cause in terms of our institutions. Um, I don't know that, I mean, when I look at the news, I certainly don't hear a lot of intelligent conversation explaining this issue as a nonpartisan issue, as one that is basic to our survival as a democracy. And so I think we do. I, I speak at law schools quite frequently, and I chide um, law deans and, and professors for not building more attention or not focusing more attention on the importance of lawyers and uh, of lawyers in educating the public and themselves graduating from law school with respect for the process. Um, think about how many people on the Judiciary Committee have graduated from law school and look at how many of them are acting. That really, to me, is incredible that um, trained lawyers did not, do not believe that it is important to judge on the basis of qualification. You're absolutely right, and I think the American people feel very, very strongly about this, that it's, it's, it's awful to be whole, and it's very damaging to the judiciary, particularly to your court. Our time is up. I think you've been fantastic. Um,